Alliance for Environmental Education Outstanding Youth Environmental Leader. He has been presenting with the Texas Bluebird Society since he was 16 years old. Started public speaking at the age of 13. This dude is afraid of no one, so don't expect him to show any signs of fear or nervousness up here, okay? He's a shock caller is what we call him. Mr. Alec Wyatt, everybody. Hi, thank you very much. This is my third time being at this event, and so I'm really excited to be here again. Uh, I love getting to know everybody here. Every time I've been here, I've uh, gotten to know more people. Can't hear me yet? All right, let's see what I can do about that. How about now? Any better? Good? Okay. Excellent. <clears throat> I'll be uh, really pleasantly surprised if I can make it to the end of this presentation without something going catastrophically wrong with the equipment up here. So uh, bear with me and, uh, and wish me luck. So um, I'm really happy that I know a lot of you now. I've gotten to meet a lot of you uh, over the past few years. And uh, this may be, unfortunately, for the foreseeable future, my last time being here. Um, I'm a senior in high school right now, and so I'm headed to college this fall off on uh, the other end of the country, way out east. Um, I would love to be back if I can, but for now, I'm happy to be here with you one last time for now. I've been tasked with Birding 101, a uh, crash course of sorts on uh, watching birds, enjoying them, identifying them, uh, and otherwise finding out how to be a birder if you're not one already. Um, I happen to be of the opinion that being a birder doesn't necessitate having a lot of skills, being able to identify everything you see. Uh, I think if you enjoy what you're watching, and I would presume that all of you do if you're here, then you're as good of a birder as you ever need to be. However, if you're interested in uh, learning some new things, then I hope you can find something useful here. So when I was trying to figure out how to start, a presentation called Birding 101, I was thinking uh, how to get to the basics, how to uh, begin with something that kind of we all take for granted as just being there, something that uh, we can all watch on a daily basis. And so I thought, what, what is some fundamental question that I can start with that's going to be uh, insightful to delve into? And I thought, well, maybe it can be, why do we watch birds? Or what is a birder? And I thought, no, I can do better than that. I'm going to get to the most fundamental question that there is. What is a bird? <laughs> and I mean, I don't know. I looked it up. Uh, I found a, a pretty good definition that I like um, on the most credible scientific source I could find, Wikipedia. Um, and so I'm going to read you the definition that I found. I think it's a pretty good one. It says, birds, also known as avian dinosaurs, are a group of endothermic vertebrates characterized by feathers, toothless beaked jaws, the laying of hard-shelled eggs, a high metabolic rate, a four-chambered heart, and a strong yet lightweight skeleton. Now, I, I think that's a pretty good, complete definition. I also think it's a funny one because I've never in my life heard anyone refer to birds as avian dinosaurs. Um, I, I think if they called this the Texas Blue Avian Dinosaur Society, nobody would come. Uh, so it's, it is what it is. But uh, regarding those sort of specificities of what birds are, uh, endothermic means they're warm-blooded, just like us. Uh, on average, birds' body temperatures are around 105 degrees Fahrenheit, which is pretty warm, uh, certainly warmer than ours. It varies depending on the body size, um, but they're, they're, they're warm-blooded just like we are. And that's, that's a distinction that not all animals share. I mean, uh, we as mammals are warm-blooded. Uh, birds are as well, and not a lot of others are. Uh, they're also vertebrates. That means they have a backbone. Uh, they're in the phylum chordata, which includes people uh, and most of the complex organisms. Uh, they also have feathers, which are highly complex structures thought to have evolved for thermoregulation, possibly from reptilian scales, although that is a subject of intense debate still. Uh, they also have four-chambered hearts, again, just like we do. 
Uh, this keeps fresh oxygenated blood separate from the depleted blood flowing through their system. That's shared by mammals, birds, and also crocodilians. And they have that strong, lightweight skeleton, which sets them apart and allows them to uh, fly so spectacularly. Many of their bones are hollow, uh, and some are fused, like the keeled sternum in the front, uh, where they have the, the large, strong, muscular wing uh, muscles connected to their skeleton. So I decided it was important that we actually find out what a bird is. The answer, I guess, is that they're avian dinosaurs. So now let's, let's move on to the other question of kind of how we watch them. Uh, we don't do it now how, we, how they used to. Does anyone recognize this person? Almost, yeah, uh, yep, I hear, I hear a few out there. This is John James Audubon. Um, and uh, he's carrying the predecessor to the binoculars. Um, back then, uh, birding usually consisted of shooting what you were watching rather than just observing it. And I mean, it was, it was different at that time. He was, uh, a lot of people were collecting specimens. He was collecting specimens for observation, for uh, writing his book, Birds of America. Uh, he was a, an ornithologist, a naturalist, and a painter, and uh, he created some of the best accounts of the birds of North America that we, we have today and some of the earliest. Um, and so collecting those specimens was important for, for what he did. There was also uh, a large number of people who were collectors back then. They, they had collections of uh, bird skins. And the, the difference between hunting birds then and hunting birds now is that back then it was unregulated. You could shoot whatever you wanted. Uh, and so the unfortunate consequence uh, we know today uh, are from birds like this, the ivory-billed woodpecker, passenger pigeon, and Carolina parakeet. Uh, those are awful pictures, by the way. They're mine. Um, Th those birds went extinct partially due to completely unregulated hunting and collecting. And the, the unfortunate thing that happened was when people saw that the numbers of these birds were dropping, that they were becoming endangered, the prevailing practice was to shoot more of them because collectors wanted to snag a specimen before the bird went extinct. How incredible is that? That that, that was the thing to do, was to collect more of them. Uh, I mean, the, par uh, the Carolina parakeet that was our, our native parakeet species in the United States. And uh, I once read that it was apparently a delicacy. If you got 12 Carolina parakeets, it made a great pie. I, the, the passenger pigeons would be in flocks that were so dense they would make the sky darken. And you could go out there just with shotguns, shoot the shotgun straight into the air, and they would fall out of the sky. And you could sell them as food. So a brief word about hunting today. Uh, it's different now. I mean, hunting is, is regulated. You need a license, such as uh, if you're hunting waterfowl, the Federal Migratory Bird Hunting and Conservation Stamp, also known as the Duck Stamp. They contribute huge sums to the conservation of lands that uh, protect bird populations today. And so hunters are a great conservation asset today. So hunting has changed, uh, but the observation of birds has also changed since then. Today we use uh, a little bit different tools than John James Audubon used. Now we have on the market today a huge number of these, and our dilemma is now trying to decide which one to get. There are hundreds. So for those of you who may be in the market for a pair of binoculars, or you're interested in uh, learning some of the numbers associated with those binoculars, I'd like to talk a little bit about some optics. So first off, there's no way to tell by just looking at these pictures, but there's a huge price range for binoculars. And it's not immediately apparent what the difference is between something you pay $250 for and something you pay 10 times as much for. So I'd like to explain that a little bit. Uh, and then you have all these other numbers that don't have to do with the price, like uh, 10s and 8s and 7s in front and the 42s and the 32s and the 50 afterwards, and you might be wondering, well, you know, what, what differentiates them? Why, why does one cost so much more than the other, and which one should I get? So with all that, let's start with the numbers. Um, almost any pair of binoculars that you find will have this pair of numbers here. Um, I know there's uh, one in the auction out there that I think is 12 by 42, 12 by 50, something like that. 
so these numbers, the, the first one, the eight uh, in this case, usually it's a seven, eight, 10, or a 12 for most binoculars that you'd find on the market for hunting or birding. That number's the magnification. Uh, so that one's pretty straightforward to learn. An eight is gonna make whatever you're looking at appear eight times closer. Uh, the 42 is the size of the objective lens in millimeters. I brought my binoculars up here. The objective lens is, the, those are the big ones on the front. These are the ocular lenses, the ones you look through. Um, the objective lens is the one on the front. It's 42 millimeters. Um, most commonly, you'll see 32, 42, or 50 millimeter binoculars. Uh, and the difference there is going to be uh, one of light gathering. And so I'll, I'll get back to uh, magnification first, and we'll come back to that other number. Uh, I tried to illustrate for you just sort of a difference between that eight magnification and that 10 magnification. Uh, there's not one that's better than the other. It's a matter of preference, and bigger is not always better. It seems kind of right from the beginning that the one on the right, the 10 by 42, you get a closer view of that bluebird, and so it is better. Um, but there are some other things to consider, like the field of view. Uh, the eight by 42 has a much wider field of view, meaning that at any uh, given object you look at, you're going to see more of the field with an eight power binocular than a 10 power binocular. And that may not make a huge difference all the time, but if you're looking up into a tree trying to find a warbler and you're moving around like this trying to find where it is, it really helps to have a wider field of view to find that bird. So it depends on whatever you prefer. Uh, if your hands are a little bit shaky, a higher magnification is also going to magnify that shake. So uh, if you want to steady your view, a lower magnification tends to be better. Um, there's also a little bit of a brightness difference. If you do a lot of uh, observation early in the uh, morning and dawn or in twilight, uh, you're gonna gather more light from your binoculars from a lower magnification binocular. So something to consider when you're looking at magnification. My personal preference is, is for the eight power. I like lower powered binoculars. Uh, one of my favorites that I ever looked through was a seven by 42. Um, I, I think the picture in a lower magnification binocular is better uh, for me, for my preference. Now also considering price. Uh, this is a generalization and it doesn't apply to all binoculars, certainly there are exceptions, but the trend is that you get what you pay for with optics. Uh, if you're paying more for optics, you're getting uh, brighter images, sharper uh, images, truer colors, less distortion around the edges, and they're also more durable. They're gonna last longer and you get a better warranty. Uh, so the view of the Bluebird on the left costs 10 times more than the view of the Bluebird on the right. Uh, the question I can't answer for you is, is that one 10 times better than the other one? Worth spending that money? I don't know. Now regarding those different uh, lens sizes. Larger lenses mean a bigger, heavier binocular, uh, but also a brighter view in those pre-dawn and twilight conditions. The larger lenses you have out front, the more light you're going to gather, uh, but the heavier and bigger binocular you're going to carry around. Um, those small lenses are really nice, light, compact, easy to uh, handle for hands that fatigue easily, and if you do a lot of traveling, they're great to carry around. Uh, 42 millimeter lenses tend to be the most common, because they're a great compromise. A lot of birders use 42 millimeter lenses. So probably your most common binoculars on the market are eight by 42 and 10 by 42. You can't go wrong with those. So generally, magnification, the trend is lower magnification means brighter image, wider field of view, less shake, but also a more distant view of the bird you're trying to see. Higher magnification is gonna be a little bit dimmer in a smaller field of view, and it's gonna magnify that shake, but you get a closer view of what you're trying to look at. For lens size, as you get smaller, the binocular itself is lighter to carry, uh, but the view you're getting is a little dimmer, uh, but they're more compact. Larger lenses mean it's heavier, you get a nice bright image, but they're pretty bulky. I won't put a slide up here for price because binoculars are so variable, uh, and sometimes that price reflects a difference in preference, personal preference, rather than a difference in quality. For instance, 10 by 42 binoculars typically cost a little bit more than eight by 42s, but that doesn't mean they're better. So, enough about optics. Now for the birds themselves, I'd like to talk a little bit about identifying birds. Uh, 
I didn't have a process, really, for learning how to identify birds. I read a lot of field guides, I spent a lot of time outside watching them at feeders and in the woods, and uh, so when I was recently uh, asked to give a presentation trying to explain how to identify birds for people who were trying to do it for the first time, I had to put a lot of thought into it, um, just like I googled what is a bird, uh, I had to look up and, and, and do some research how to identify birds. I hadn't put that much systematic thought into it. So I eventually came up with a few steps that I think are good uh, to start with if you're uh, a first timer trying to identify the birds that you're seeing, maybe past just the ones that you're feeder. So step one, I think it's a good idea to focus on what's probable. Uh, there are 10,313 species that have been reported in the whole world, according to eBird, and we'll get to eBird later. That's a big number of species. Uh, so if we want to narrow it down a little bit, for those of us that are in North America, which applies to a good many of us at this time, uh, 2,115 is how many have been reported in North America, which is still far greater than the number of bird species I would ever want to try and memorize from a book. So if we just look at the state of Texas, we're still left with 658. The nice thing is that you can narrow that down even further, looking at uh, individual regions, your own county, uh, even individual places a few minutes away from your house and see what, those, uh, what birds are there that you're likely to see. And I think the best tool you can possibly use to start becoming familiar with what is probable is the lovely thing called eBird, the network of citizen scientists across the world that submit their observations to a, a, a common source where we can all access that information and, and really find some great data for ourselves to use. So if we go to the eBird website, uh, one of my favorite things to do is go up to the Explore Data tab up there and you can look at everything anyone's ever submitted to eBird. There's some great things you can do with that, like looking at bar charts to see uh, across the span of a year what the frequency of different species are uh, in a particular place, whether it's an entire state or uh, a particular birding location. You can also, with the species maps, look at the occurrence of a particular species. If you're just looking for uh, golden-cheeked warblers in central Texas, you can type in golden-cheeked warbler and see where they've been seen recently and how many and who's reported them where um, for when you're interested in one species. Uh, you can look at particular hotspots, find the places around your area where people have seen the most birds. You can explore a particular, a particular region, which can be uh, a state or uh, a country or a small area within your state and see what people have been reporting lately. Uh, you can even look at uh, those line graphs to explore uh, species occurrence over time to see whether a species is getting more or less common in your area. You can look for photos and sounds and uh, videos that people have submitted. There's, there's such a massive amount of information that you can find on eBird. Uh, it's really tempting to spend a lot of hours there, and so I do. Um, it's, uh, it's also particularly gratifying to go out and identify birds and keep a checklist and then contribute your own observations to this so that others can use that. It's, uh, it's quite a collaboration. So. Uh, I'm here at uh, the bar charts. I put in McLennan County, which is where we are right now. Uh, and you can start going through, I think this is the best way to, to become familiar with what's around you. Uh, to, to put in your county and go through these bar charts, uh, see what species you're likely to find and what time of year. So that would be my recommendation. Uh, find out what's probable because of those 10,000 some species in the world, you're only likely to find a few hundred of them max in your county. So that's a good way to start narrowing it down. Um, I think step two is learn the groups. Uh, and I don't have a great recommendation for how to do that aside from uh, find a great book, a great field guide or something and start learning bird families. So that way instead of being outside and uh, looking and saying that's a little brown bird, maybe you can at least get as far as saying that's a sparrow and now you can look through your book and try and find out what sparrow it is. So as far as the groups go, Organisms are classified in a system called taxonomy, uh, initially developed by the Swedish botanist Carl Linnaeus. Uh, they're grouped into taxa from the broadest to, to the most specific, from uh, the huge groups, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, and then down to the smaller ones, family, genus, and finally species, or even farther down into subspecies. Uh, I think it's a good idea to learn the, the families of birds in your area. 
so that you give yourself a better chance of, uh, of finding out what you're looking for. Uh, beyond that, know your habitat. Even if you're in a species range, you can look in your field guide and find those range maps and see that you're in a species range, you're not likely to see it unless you're also in its preferred habitat. Field guides use all sorts of crazy terms, such as coastal chaparral, riparian woods, riparian thickets, uh, all the way down to meadow edges within montane coniferous forests, which is awfully specific. But all of these terms were uh, in a two-page spread in the Sibley Guide to Birds. I, I opened the book to, to one page and found all of these terms uh, in just two pages. So it's a good idea to uh, be aware of where you're at because that'll help out quite a bit as well. Uh, Sibley can get awfully specific that way. For the broad-tailed hummingbird, they apparently prefer montane dry coniferous woods with openings such as aspen groves, meadows, and riparian thickets of willows. So I, I don't think I've ever been in an environment that meets those exact specifications, but uh, if you're looking for broad-tailed hummingbirds, go there. <laughs> so uh, a little bit of an exercise. Looking at this bird, and, and I use this example intentionally, because everything I'll say not to do, I did. Uh, looking at this bird, if you don't know what it is, you might be tempted to open up a field guide and flip through the sparrows, or maybe if you don't know it's a sparrow, just the small brown birds. And if you do, and I did, then you'll flip to this page and maybe call it a song sparrow and you'll be wrong. So I recommend that you resist the urge to do so and try to avoid being wrong. You'll, you'll go to this page and you'll say, it looks a lot like one of those, and that seems good enough. But I have a fourth step for you before that. It's observe closely, which is probably the one that took me the longest to learn. I figured out how to uh, read the field guide pretty early, but it took me a few years before I learned how to actually watch birds closely. It's too tempting to look at a bird for five seconds and say, oh, that's, I'm gonna look for the little brown birds now in the book, and uh, try and match it with something. You have to observe the bird really closely, uh, and then you can go and find something that matches what you know you saw, instead of trying to, find, uh, or trying to convince yourself that you saw something in the book. So looking back at this bird, uh, if you study it closely in the field, you'll see that it's finely marked and sandy colored on the sides. You might even hear it vocalized, that's a big help. Uh, only after you've observed all the details of its shape, size, color, posture, and habits, uh, should you go to step five which is finally consult your field guide. Then you can find a bird in the book that matches what you know you saw. And if you do so, you might just end up here and say, it's a Lincoln Sparrow, and you would be correct. I eventually found out that it was a Lincoln Sparrow that I saw rather than a Song Sparrow, uh, but only after I completed a field notebook page calling it a Song Sparrow and submitted it to be judged. <laughs> just for comparison, here's a Lincoln Sparrow compared with the Song Sparrow. If you don't observe them closely, they're reasonably similar looking. They have a lot of the same patterns and colors, uh, and they're about the same size, and they are closely related to each other, but uh, it helps out a lot to observe them closely if you're interested in getting to learn those birds. So here's my best guess at uh, a good way to start learning to identify birds if you're not familiar with it already. Um, like I said, I didn't really do this. Uh, it doesn't have to be that structured. I learned how to identify birds by putting up feeders and nest boxes in my backyard uh, and occasionally reading some books. I had a lot of fun just sitting for a few hours and reading through my field guides. Uh, and that, that worked for me. I mean, that kind of unstructured way of learning worked for me. But I think if I had done this, I might have been a little more successful. If I had learned to observe closely at the beginning, I would have been a little more successful a little faster. A great way to get yourself to observe closely is something that most uh, great birders will agree is probably the best way to hone your skills is to take notes and make illustrations in the field. Uh, now, I am absolutely not an expert in this. I'm not an expert in any of this. I'm only in the process of trying to get better at this, trying to get better at uh, observing what I'm seeing and uh, learning how to take notes on it and draw it. Uh, but taking field notes, I think, is without a doubt the best way to make sure you're paying close attention and committing that to memory. So I'll show you where I started and where I've gone a little bit since then. This was the beginning. 
for me. Uh, this was March 4th, 2009. This was a little yellow field notebook that I got as, uh, I actually won it in a drawing at school. And I took it home that day and I thought, ah, oh, gee, I wonder what the first bird I'm gonna see is. And it was a white-breasted nuthatch. You can almost tell that that's a bird there on the tree. <laughs> um, it doesn't really look like one. <laughs> um, the, the legs are about the same size as the rest of the body, which I, isn't correct, but, um, but it was good to get me watching the bird. I mean, I, I spent some time, I guess, from 3.46 p.m. to 4.04 uh, p.m. just observing that bird's behaviors. I wrote down what sorts of noises it was making and um, how it foraged and how it was moving from tree to tree, and I think at some point another nuthatch showed up nearby, and I was trying to observe uh, how it was finding food in the barks of the tree. It, it's a nuthatch, so it's probing that bill into the, into the bark of the tree and trying to find some food. And I think if I didn't have this notebook, I probably would have looked at the birds, said that's a nuthatch, and walked off someplace else. Um, if not for committing the time to writing all this down, I wouldn't have made the observations at all. So moving on a little bit, jumping up to July 2012, uh, I switched notebooks. Now I, I sort of like the blank pages for a little while. And uh, I started making multiple illustrations and uh, descriptions of the nest of the birds and the appearance of the young. And uh, it, was a, it was a little better. You can tell that they're birds, mostly. Um, there was no color, there's not a lot of detail, but. Uh, but again, it, it, it forced me to get to know these birds. I, I had a lot of fun watching these birds. Um, they nested under a deck in, in the back of my house. Um, I remember when I first saw the, the female sitting on the eggs in the nest, uh, all I saw was sort of a little brownish head and a tail sticking out of the nest, and I thought it was, uh, I thought she was a bluebird, actually. Um, that was back before I knew how to really identify birds. They ended up being uh, Cordilleran flycatchers. Um, but they were a lot of fun to watch. Moving a little farther forward, I started adding some color and more detail in the appearances alongside those illustrations, and the pages started filling up a little bit more. Uh, made all sorts of notes on uh, the behaviors and particular little details of what the birds looked like and started comparing different species. I had a lot of fun watching the hummingbirds at my feeders in my backyard in Colorado. Uh, we had uh, these three species that showed up pretty frequently, and um, it, uh, drawing them really committed them to memory for me. Moving forward, it got pretty chaotic. Uh, I ended up with pages that were crammed full of almost illegible notes on eight different species on this page. Um, I, I figured the more things on one page, the better it was. Um, and so my writing got smaller and smaller, and now I, I don't even know how you would begin to interpret the words on that page or uh, understand what species I'm referring to when I say what. So I eventually decided I had to organize it a little bit more. I got some great advice. Uh, from some excellent birders in the American Birding Association who were judging my work, and they recommended a few things for me uh, as far as organizing those notes and improving them a little bit. So I got to here uh, where I had taxonomic lists in the left margin there uh, with counts of each of the birds that I saw that day and uh, information on the habitat where I was and the location that I saw the birds. Uh, I separated each species into little boxes and differentiated between my descriptions of their physical characteristics and their behaviors, and it got awfully tedious. It took me hours to do these things. I probably spent two or three hours just on this one page, um, but I really cherish that time I put into that. I mean, it, it, it vastly improved my ability to uh, understand the birds I was seeing. Uh, I, I was able to I improve on that method a little bit, drawing birds in multiple postures and multiple lighting conditions and all that. So that's, uh, that's about as good as I ever got. Um, since then, I've, I've gone back to those old little yellow lined field notebooks uh, where I, I keep a lot of lists of the birds that I see. Uh, but I still try to observe closely. Uh, I will also, as I've said already, reinforce that I'm not an expert at this. There are people my age or younger who are really, really good at this stuff. Uh, here are a couple of examples of notebook pages. This is from a young birder named Kaylin, published in the American Birding Association's Birders Field Notebook Manual, which is a great resource if you want to learn how to make a great field notebook. Uh, a lot of my ideas came from her. 
she's an amazing artist. These pages are beautiful. The notes that she has are incredibly high quality. Uh, she even has uh, some notes on, or even sketches of the environment where she was and the trees she was around and the house and the uh, compass directions. So um, there, there are some experts out there and I highly recommend getting to know them and getting some advice from them because that's a great way to improve your skills. So I'd like to get towards concluding this with uh, the record of what was probably the first bluebird I ever saw. Uh, this was in, uh, on March 20th, 2009, just over eight years ago today at my house in Black Forest, Colorado. There's a tiny little illustration of that bird up at the top of the box. Uh, I only saw it for a few seconds. I didn't know exactly what it was at first. In fact, I, I think for some reason I, I thought it was an eastern bluebird. I wasn't in the right place for an eastern bluebird, but uh, I knew it was a bluebird. And I was really excited to see it. I'd never even seen one before. I'd lived in uh, Black Forest for uh, a little less than a year at that point, and it was incredibly exciting to me to see that bright blue bird flash past me uh, when I was out in the yard. And so I had to make a field notebook page on it. Uh, a couple years later, I was still writing about those guys and drawing those guys. Um, they, a pair of bluebirds nested in the nest box in my yard from 2010 uh, all the way through the year that we moved in 2014. This page is from April 15th, 2013, at, right at the start of the breeding season when this pair was first inspecting the nest box in my yard. Um, I have great memories of going out to the nest boxes in early and mid-April and uh, finding nests in boxes that were covered in snow and uh, the vacant boxes had an inch or so of snow down in the bottom of them, and the bluebirds were still out there scouting out boxes to nest in and beginning to build their nests. Uh, and I got to watch this pair build a nest and raise their young right outside my back door. Uh, those are, are memories that I long to have back, uh, and, and I'm eager to continue those, uh, those observations. I'd love to have another nest box trail someday to watch those birds again. Uh, so bluebirds, have been a part of my life for a long time. Uh, after leaving that trail behind, uh, I cherished the opportunity to come here to join this group of people and uh, to get to know all of you and give some presentations uh, for you. Uh, I've enjoyed it immensely and I hope that I can be back sometime. And uh, in the meantime, I'll be watching the bluebirds alongside you. So thank you very much for having me. Take some questions. Awesome. All right, I have about five minutes. Is it okay if I take some Go questions? Go for it. All right. Yes. All right, what am I going to major in? Um, I have a little bit better answer to that now than I did a year ago. Uh, at this point, I'm thinking I'm most interested in uh, environmental science, maybe with some economics in there too. Um, I'm really interested in the intersection between environmental issues and economic issues. I'm trying to find a way to make uh, the idea of conservation work for people who aren't very concerned about conservation. Um, I think that's the only way to make it work. I think that's the best way to make it work. Because right now when we have two camps of people, uh, one group feels like it's absolutely dire that we protect our natural resources and another group that doesn't really care uh, because they have their own things to care about I'd like to bridge the gap. So that's, uh, that's what I'm interested in studying right now. I'm going to college this fall. Uh, where? I'm going to Williams College. Uh, I just heard the news this past week of college decisions. Uh, and so this is, this is new for me. I'm still getting used to the idea that I'm not going to be living at home forever. But uh, I'll be going to Williams College this fall. Yes? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't know. I'll have to see if I, uh, if I can get down here. I would love to. <laughs> yes? The, the field notebook? Uh, it was called the uh, American Birding Association uh, Birders Field Notebook Manual, I think. Let me back up a little bit and, and check for sure. Actually, let's see. American Birding Association Birders Field Notebook Manual. Yeah, that's what it was called. Okay. Anyone else? All right, thank you very much.
All right. Thank you so much, Alec.